Welcome to Trade Finance Talks, a podcast from Trade Finance Global. During this series, we'll be hearing from global experts, as well as learning about the latest trends, technology and insights in the world of international trade and receivables finance. Episode 106. I think what we know on the economic crime front, there is an absolutely huge fraud epidemic and it's touching everyone's lives. Welcome to Trade Finance Talks. My name is Pesh Patel, editor at Trade Finance Global, and I'll be your podcast host today as we discuss the Economic Crime Act and anti-corruption in the UK and beyond. We're delighted to partner with City and Financial Global for the Economic Sanctions Summit 2023. Now, the UK government passed the Economic Crime Transparency and Enforcement Act in 2022, aiming to curb economic crime, but also increase transparency of companies owned by overseas non-UK entities and lessen the requirements to impose sanctions on individuals. In recent years, 64% of businesses have reportedly experienced financial fraud, corruption or other financial crimes, 64%. And additionally, the UK government identified 929 UK companies involved in corruption and money laundering, leading to £137 billion worth of economic damage. So with so many people and companies experiencing these problems, It's important for the government to address these crimes and for corporates to understand how the Economic Crime Act can help them operate in a much safer manner. One of the tenets of trade finance is fraud prevention and risk mitigation. So tackling this problem is vital for the expansion of safe and effective trade finance solutions. This is quite an important piece of legislation in the financial and economic world, which is why we're happy to welcome Susan Hawley, Executive Director of Spotlight on Corruption, on our podcast to help clarify some questions. Susan, welcome to Trade Finance Talks. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. So good to have you here on the show. Can you give us a quick overview of your background? Who are you? Where are you from? And what do you do in your current position? I'm currently Executive Director of Spotlight on Corruption, which is a charity that actually I set up about three years ago. And its specific focus is looking at how the UK enforces its anti-corruption laws and implements its international anti-corruption commitments. My background, I've been doing policy research and campaigning on the role that the UK plays globally in facilitating corruption for over 20 years now, and I've always been a very keen watcher of what kind of enforcement is going on and how effective the UK is being. Thanks, Susan. Good overview. And I'm guessing it's not an insignificant role that the UK plays here. The Economic Crime Act was passed last year in 2022. Can you talk over some of the main points of the Act and how you think the Act will help the UK counter economic crime in the year moving forward 2023? The Economic Crime Act did three things. The first of all, it introduced a new register of foreign ownership of UK property. The second is it made reforms to so-called McMafia powers the UK introduced called unexplained wealth orders, which it introduced after the Skripal poisoning. And finally, it really radically amended the UK sanctions legislation to make it much easier for UK officials to put people on the sanctions list and to impose civil penalties for sanctions breaches. They're quite specific things. They were only really a small part of the big range of measures that A, needs to be done and B, the government is intending to do. So I think just on those very specific measures, I think we're still really waiting to see how they're going to play out. And the results are a bit mixed so far. So, for instance, the new register of foreign property ownership, it's still being developed. The deadline for registration of beneficial owners is is the end of January 2023. Once the register is fully up and running, properly searchable, and whether we see real penalties on people for not registering, whether that register is going to be really properly enforced. I think on the second point, the McMafia unexplained wealth orders, 
I think, really honestly, that was a little bit gimmicky. We know from talking to law enforcement, they don't really like using UWOs very much. They much prefer some of the other much um, more robust powers that are there. And the thing to be remembered, despite all the hype about unexplained wealth orders, is they're just an investigative tool. They don't actually get you the money at the end. So law enforcement much prefers to go to tools that actually help them get the money quicker. So far, you know, it's nearly a year ago since it was introduced, you know, there's been discussion that there's just one unexplained wealth order that's been applied for, and that one doesn't seem to be in relation to dirty money at all. Perhaps the most dramatic bit is really around sanctions, because they literally did rewrite in a matter of weeks and then rushed it through Parliament, the whole of UK sanctions legislation. And there's no doubt that this made it much easier for the UK to impose sanctions in the case of Russia. We're still waiting to see whether there are going to be any challenges to those designations. We also know from all the press stories coming out that sanctions are quite easy to get around. I mean, you just transfer the assets to your child or your business associate. So, and it's also worth noting there haven't yet been any civil penalties imposed as a result of the act in relation to Russia. I think on all those measures, we're still really waiting to see how they're going to pan out. And they're still really quite work in progress. I guess it seems like there's been a bit of a reactive rather than proactive approach here. I mean, you've seen specific activities and incidents that have led to the passages of these acts. I mean, from your perspective as an expert in the field, is the UK government doing the right thing? And are the right areas actually being addressed in in the wider context of economic crime and anti-corruption within this bill? I think they're definitely doing the right thing. There's no doubt about it that Russia's invasion of Ukraine was a pivotal moment where suddenly the government was like, wow, we've really got to take this seriously. How do we become so vulnerable to Russian illicit finance? And you've got to remember that it was only about six weeks before the invasion that it looked like the government weren't going to drop a lot of these measures altogether from its legislative programme. But quite a few of them were already kind of on the agenda. So they're kind of oven ready, so to speak, uh, to use a hackneyed phrase, but they were literally on the shelf waiting to go. And they'd been waiting, some of them, a few years, like, you know, legislation being written, the consultations have been done. So I think in relation to the property register, you know, that was a case in point, like everyone being going, where's the property register for at least two years? And a lot of this started from the anti-corruption summit that was held in London in 2016, where there was a lot of big thinking about how do we get serious about playing the UK's role as a global financial centre in actually making this worse and helping dirty money circulate and, and be laundered. I think the government are absolutely doing the right thing. I think whether it's enough, I mean, the bottom line is no, but I think the government recognised that. So I think already what we have is a new second economic crime bill going through Parliament at the moment. It's just coming up to the end of um, its process in the Commons and then it'll go to the Lords. And that's the Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Bill. And that covers companies' house and it's like the most major reform of kind of corporate transparency in decades. And that will require companies to actually verify who is behind these companies, because what you've had up to now is companies has just been a repository for information which it can't challenge, it can't check, and it can't change if that information's wrong. And we've seen time and again companies' house being, and UK companies being used in big laundromats. The other thing that bill going through Parliament does, it has more regulation enforcement powers against cryptocurrencies. It allows much more intelligence sharing between the private sector so they can kind of pool intelligence around suspects and suspicious activity and it introduces several new intelligence powers for law enforcement bodies. So I think the last year's ECA was, I think most people recognise, the beginning getting serious rather than the end. And there are a couple of other things in the pipeline this year which will really keep the temperature up on this issue. One is the government have been drafting a new economic crime plan, and they're also drafting a new anti-corruption strategy. We expect to see both of those come out before the summer this year. 
Thank you very much. So lots going on in 2023. The Economic Group Crime and Transparency Bill, plans for economic crime and the anti-corruption plan as well. You talked about the UK as a global financial centre. Though the 2022 bill was passed in the UK under common law, what do you think of the international implications of this? Because coming from the trade and trade finance sphere, a lot of the crime is done across borders. Yes, absolutely. The sanctions aspect of the Economic Crime Act was critical for helping the UK be more, or act in more cooperation with its allies. Internationally, it's helped the UK become a player alongside you know, the US and Australia and Canada. There are areas where we think it needs to go a lot further, if I'm honest. You know, they focus very heavily on Russia for very obvious reasons, but are they actually going to use sanctions for other kleptocratic regimes or anti-corruption scenarios? You know, on the sanctions front, you will get the international implications are that the UK can be a bit more proactive. I think the foreign property ownership and companies' house verification aspect of both the last bill and the forthcoming bill, they are important for keeping pressure up internationally on other jurisdictions. And we saw just at the end of last year that the European Court of Justice has actually closed down public registers of beneficial ownership in the EU. And I think the UK is really sticking to its guns and having public registers. And if it can really make the company's house verification work, so we don't just have a public register, but a meaningful public register where you can actually get accurate information, it will be quite a beacon, actually, of really crucial corporate transparency information. So I think there'll be a lot more coming up this year, really around that issue of privacy, versus fight against economic crime and how you balance those two. And there's very different attitudes in different jurisdictions about how you do that. It sounds like the Act is, is part of a broader effort to increase oversight for financial crime rather than just being a standalone bill. I guess just looking at what's ahead for 2023 and especially looking at the headwinds and challenges we're facing, what do you think are the most important areas to focus on for anti-corruption and economic crime prevention? And what do you think is next for the UK government? Well, I think what we know on the economic crime front is that there is an absolutely huge fraud epidemic and it's touching everyone's lives. I don't know about you, Deepesh, but I'm in this field and, you know, I sit around with friends and everyone's been touched in some way, whether it's they've been scammed or nearly fallen for a scam. It's a really, really huge issue. And there are lots of cross-cutting areas with corruption. You know, you need the same skills for tackling it. But there's also, we have to make sure that other issues don't get drowned out by the fraud epidemic. So I think that's one issue for 2023. I think the other issue is that something that's really come up over the last couple of years is that we can't take it for granted that we don't have our own problem with corruption in the UK. And there's been a growing sense, you know, we've seen it with kind of PPE procurement scandals that, you know, we've got a problem here too. This isn't something we just help happen in other countries. This is something that also happens in the UK and really working out what that means and how you get effective enforcement against domestic corruption. I think bigger picture, you know, the economic circumstances are going to be really tight. We've got a cost of living crisis. We've got a big crunch on public spending. We know that when that happens, people cut corners, companies cut compliance and economic crime increases. And I think coupled with that, you have a couple of really big issues emerging politically. You know, one is massive kind of deregulation agenda or the Edinburgh reforms that the UK government wants to push. And you know, we know from experience and from the literature that a light touch regulatory regime increases financial and economic crime. But we also know that with Brexit, you know, more companies are investing in much higher risk jurisdictions and the UK is going to be much more willing to accept inward investment from high risk jurisdictions. So there are, you know, a, a lot of threats on the horizon to be clear. I think, you know, what the UK government has been weakest on is really talking about enforcement. Like it's, you know, laws are relatively cheap to pass, but enforcing them and making sure they actually work is really crucial. And I think until we really 
have a proper debate in the UK about how we want to see enforcement ramped up, you know, what makes effective enforcement and how can we reinvest much more of the assets that law enforcement brings in back into law enforcement so it can have competitive salaries, can have the most up-to-date IT. These are all, you know, really, really important questions. For businesses and corporates alike, really being able to navigate this agenda is is crucially important moving into 2023. And as you mentioned, you know, the UK's deregulation, light touch regulatory regime really can and will increase financial crime. And it's all around how will the National Crime Agency enforce some of the new powers granted to it under this act. But look, Thank you very much for joining us, Sue, and we look forward to hearing more from you. As I mentioned earlier, TFG are delighted to be partnering with the City and Financial Global Economic Sanctions Summit 2023, and that's going to be held at the Hallam Conference Centre in London on Tuesday, the 31st of January 2023. And uh, to our, any readers interested in attending, please go to tradefinanceglobal.com forward slash conferences to find out more about that conference. Sue, such a pleasure and look forward to hearing more from you at the summit later on this month. Thank you. Thank you, Deepesh. Lovely to chat to you. Thanks for listening to Trade Finance Talks. Be sure to subscribe to our podcasts at tradefinanceglobal.com.